In the last two winters, there was a real risk of blackouts. What I'm going to do over the next hour or so uh, is talk about how did we ever get to that point? How does a rich, industrialized, reasonably well-governed country like the United Kingdom get into a situation where the lights may go out because we simply do not make enough electricity. That's going to occupy uh, sort of the first half of my talk. Then I'm going to turn to deeper problems, deeper problems that plague uh, electricity regulation uh, in this country uh, and focus on some of the more recent political events that are actually not new, uh, but just old issues re-emerging. Uh, my name is Richard Toll. I'm one of the professors here uh, in the economics department. You won't see me until the third year where I'm teaching uh, the economics of climate change, uh, and that's an optional course. Um, so, what happened? Uh, the headlines that you're looking at here are from uh, last year. Blackout risks rises as UK energy crisis deepens. UK power supply is enough for winter, says Net National Grid who, of course, has a duty to push back because this is their job, right? Um, are we really heading for a blackout Britain? Blackout risk recedes as National Grid pays old coal plants to stay on standby. These were events that happened uh, last year. The year before that, um, we saw fire in a coal-fired power plant. We saw cracks in a nuclear power plant, we saw fire in yet another nuclear power plant, we had problems here, we had problems there, uh, and as a result, in that winter, two winters ago, the lights almost went out. <clears throat> Same for last year, and I don't think we're out of the woods yet, and I'll get uh, back to you on that. Uh, so what you're looking at uh, on this graph is the loss of expected and uh, the loss of load expected that's what uh, lol e means and what you see in the dotted line is where we want to be the regulatory standard is that there's only four hours per year where we don't have enough electricity um, and then in blue dark blue and light blue you sort of see like oh where are we really uh, and this year as well we are projected to be just at a regulatory standard not comfortably above the regulatory standard, no, we're just at uh, the regula strand, uh, regulatory standard. Uh, and then the graph at the bottom, and I'll come back uh, to that again, says that this is mostly due to SBR. This is essentially emergency measures. Uh, that's better uh, shown in this graph in red, uh, where sort of the dark red, you're looking at your standard electricity supply. Um, and then in the pink, we add the emergency measures to it, and it's only when you do that that uh, you feel uh, comfortably safe that we won't run out of electricity uh, this winter. This is uh, some results from the national grid. Uh, I'm terrible at making graphs. I did not make this graph. I would never make a graph like this. Where uh, on the, in the top you're looking at the supply of electricity, uh, so there's a bit of nuclear, there's a bit of hydro, there's uh, some wind, some coal, some biomass. Um, OCGT and CCGT are gas, uh, and then there's a bit of pumped storage. So that is essentially how we make electricity. Uh, and what you see <coughs> is that gas is very important, wind is there in, in there as well, and total maximum electricity supply uh, is around 72 uh, gigawatts. Uh, and then in the bottom graph, we're comparing that to demand. And those are the continuous lines. Uh, blue represents high demand if it's very dark and very cold. Um, and the red uh, is a more optimistic uh, scenario of uh, demand. <clears throat> and then the bars, you're looking at how much stuff could we expect to supply in any of these weeks. Um, and what you see is, uh, not surprisingly, uh, that in the weeks just before Christmas, electricity demand peaks. And that is because it gets dark, and therefore we turn the lights on, it actually gets dark pretty early, so we 
it's many houses, we many play, many households sort of are. One member is still at work and therefore uh, using computers and light. Another household member may be at home uh, with the telly on and all the lights on and the heating on and the oven on. Uh, <coughs> so there is a large demand of electricity at that uh, particular point. Um, and the weeks before Christmas can also be very cold. And if it's very cold, you have a lot of secondary heating uh, kicking in. Most of our buildings, almost all of our houses are heated by oil or gas. But if it gets very cold, then people turn on the electric heater. And of course, in places like Heathrow or uh, shopping malls, there's actually a lot of electrical heating going on. So if it's also cold, <coughs> then it just happens that electricity demand uh, also increases. And dark and cold is a bad combination for, for power demand. <coughs> unless you're selling power, then it's of course good. Um, <coughs> and what you see is that last winter, there were scenarios where we were just at the edge of only having enough electricity, uh, that the maximum supply met uh, demand. Now this year, uh, the national grid is a lot more optimistic, um, and uh, supply has increased, they've changed the colors, and the graph is still hideous and uninformative. They sort of like show one bar graph as if it uh, spans over time, but really it's a simple bar. Uh, they've also changed the colors just to uh, confuse you, to make sure that you can't compare the supply of this year to the supply of last year. Um, <coughs> but if you look at the numbers, then what has happened really is that they reckon that electricity supply has increased from 72 gigawatts maximum electricity supply to around 96, 97. Uh, and the big difference between the two graphs is a little bit more uh, gas, there's a little bit less coal, uh, but the big difference is the blue bar at the top. Uh, that is other embedded supply and DSR, demand side uh, response. Um, <coughs> and because of this increase in uh, supply, um, we now for this winter have a more comfortable uh, margin. But there's two issues here. Uh, if you look at the uh, supply of wind, that is in purple, uh, that is almost 10 gigawatts, wind is unreliable. And if it so happens that it is dark and cold and not much wind out, then you have to subtract <coughs> the wind supply. And actually in a place like the UK, there is a correlation between wind and cold. And it just so happens that on the coldest days, there is very little wind. That's just uh, the climate that we live in. Um, <coughs> so you have to subtract that. Uh, and then the margins that you sort of see in this graph uh, uh, seem less comfortable. And then uh, the demand side response, the light blue bar at the top, what is that? That is essentially companies being asked to reduce their electricity well, not being asked, they're actually paid to reduce their electricity. And one of the biggest clients of uh, the demand side response uh, is Tesco's. So what happens if we are almost running short of electricity, an email or a signal goes to Tesco's, can you please turn off your fridges? And a company like Tesco, unlike you guys, has very big fridges, right? You guys hopefully have a small fridge, uh, and turning it off uh, doesn't uh, save a lot of electricity. Uh, but if Tesco starts turning off its frid fridges, then yes, you do have an enormous saving in electricity. Now, this is not a big deal. This is not something you should worry about uh, in terms of the quality uh, of the food that you buy from Tesco's and other uh, companies do exactly, other uh, <coughs> supermarkets do exactly the same thing, right? So this is no reason to switch. This is not a big deal for food safety because if you turn off your fridge, it stays cold for another couple of hours. But then after those couple of hours, you have to turn on your fridge again, right? Because otherwise your food will spoil. And the same is true uh, for the fridges that Tesco and other supermarkets use. So this demand side response, which is here shown to be uh, 12 gigawatts, is not a structural addition to the capacity. It's not something that you can do all the time. You can keep this up for a few hours hopefully get you through the peak electricity demands, but not much more than that. <coughs> and what um, the National Grid here disingenuously 
uh, does is just assume that this is supply that is always available. Uh, and that explains why at the moment uh, the margins look safe. But you shouldn't be surprised if at some point during uh, the next two months or so we run out of electricity. Uh, I pointed out uh, the wind, right, uh, that that is problematic. The blackouts that we saw in South Australia are most likely caused by a sudden drop in wind. Uh, and there's two things that cause a drop in wind. One, it may be cold and there's no wind, right, and that's a problem. It may also be that there's actually a big storm and you have to turn, out, turn off your wind turbines if the wind gets too high, otherwise they risk being blown away, right? So they may also be tripped out uh, during very high winds. Uh, and then, of course, you have uh, issues with triggered uh, tornadoes as well. So there is a real possibility of brownouts or blackouts uh, this month, next month, uh, and the month after. Um, what's the difference between a brownout and a blackout? A brownout, essentially national grid turns off part of the national grid. It simply says parts of town go without electricity or entire towns go without electricity. The big advantage of a brownout is that it's controlled. If it just so happens that something trips or something breaks, then you can have all sorts of ca cascading effects through your grid, through your electricity grid, and that may trip <coughs> further damage, may uh, fry some wires and all those sort of things, and that may be much harder uh, to control, A, you have much more extensive blackouts as a result, uh, but it would also take a long time to repair. <coughs> so that is why the likely scenario is that National Grid will decide that certain towns or certain, co certain customers are not worthy enough and switch them off, right, uh, rather than have uh, the situation get out of hand. So the immediate causes for this are obvious. There's too much unreliable wind, there's too much unreliable demand side uh, response on the system, uh, there's not enough capacity on the system. But this is the country that first industrialized. The first power grids were built in the UK. How did we get here? How can it be that in 2017 we are worrying about blackouts? That is something that is typically associated with countries like Lebanon or Congo, not with a European country. In order to understand the deeper causes, you need to understand a little bit uh, the market for electricity. As of today, and for the entire past, uh, you can say that electricity cannot be stored, not in large quantities, not at a reasonable price. That is slowly changing, but hasn't changed yet, right? So maybe in 10 years' time, I will have to take this out, but for now, uh, this is the case. <coughs> And that makes the electricity market completely different from, say, the markets for peanut butter. So, you have a demand for peanut butter. For some of you guys, that will be a high demand. For others, uh, maybe a much lower demand. Uh, you meet that demand by having a jar of peanut butter somewhere in your house. And essentially, you take it whenever you need. And then when you almost run out, you go to the shop and get a new <coughs> jar of peanut butter. Or you have it delivered to, you <coughs> to your house by the Ocados. Sainsbury's also has a always a supply of jars of peanut butter there. Yeah. So <coughs> the exact demand for peanut butter is actually very hard to predict. It goes up and down with your mood and whatever substitutes are available in the house. But that is not a big deal because you can store peanut butter. And therefore we are only ever interested in the aggregate demand and the aggregate supply smeared out over time. Not so for electricity because it cannot be stored. For electricity, it's very simple. Supply needs to meet demand every minute. And that makes for a completely different market. So how is this uh, done? Um, well, we always have a few power plants running that actually don't deliver electricity to the grid, but are just running in case something breaks. In, some, in case some other power plant breaks down, then we have an emergency additional supply uh, of electricity. And the way this is financed is there is a charge on everybody who supplies electricity. That is, of course, passed on to you as a consumer. Uh, this is actually done in an auction, right? So there's a charge on everybody. Then the regulator collects the money and organizes an auction every so often and buys reserve power for people to run their power plants without supplying electricity, just in case, right? Uh, so that is how this is done. 
Many people think of uh, electricity as electrons uh, running down a, a copper wire. That's one way of looking at electricity, but if there's a particle representation, then there's also a wave representation. Uh, so you can also think of electricity as waves uh, on a wire. And if those waves sort of meet each other where wires cross and the waves are not entirely in sync, you can have interference problems. Uh, so we also need to have frequency regulation to make sure that all waves on all wires have the same frequency and if they meet, uh, nothing bad will happen. And that requires uh, a form of coordination. And what you uh, see in, in smaller islands uh, like the UK, if you look at wind turbines, you see that they all turn at the same clock speed. That is not for aesthetic reasons. That is frequency regulation. If you could see the gas turbines, which you can't because they're indoors and there's no windows there, but if you could see the gas turbines, you would see that they would all turn, you would see that they all turn at the same clock speed, and at the same clock speed as your wind turbines do. Right? That is frequency regulation, uh, and that requires a regulator uh, telling people, like, this is the clock speed that you are allowed to use. Right? And furthermore, uh, what we have is that the power grid is a natural monopoly in the strict sense of the word. Right? So uh, a monopoly is natural if the costs of providing competition are higher than the benefits of having competition. So at the moment there is one main grid and there's one connection, electricity connection to your house. And of course we could double all that, right? We could have two cables to your house and two grids sitting next to each other and then have people compete. But the cost of building two electricity networks is very, very high and higher than the benefits that we could possibly gain from, com from having two grids competing with it, uh, each other. So it is a natural monopoly. And all this implies that the power market is heavily regulated and should be heavily regulated. You can't leave this to the market. The uh, spot market for electricity works as something as uh, is shown here. Uh, so we have a demand curve. Uh, that's fairly steep, uh, and the supply curve, and the supply curve is typically represented as a merit order. And this is the spot market, so this is selling electricity on the spot, like right here and right now. So fixed costs don't matter. The only thing that matters is the variable cost of electricity generation. So at the very <coughs> bottom of the merit order curve, you see wind. It essentially has a zero cost of supply at the margin. Variable cost of wind is zero because the driving force is the wind and you don't have to pay for the wind. And, and nuclear also sits at the bottom of the merit order curve because once you build a nuclear power plant, it's actually very cheap to run. It's just that building those things is very, very expensive, but running them is actually relatively cheap. So those are the cheap supplies of electricity. Uh, and then there's more expensive uh, supplies of electricity. There's uh, coal and at the very top typically sits gas. Gas is cheap to build, but expensive to run. And then when, where supply meets demand, that is where the price uh, is set. But this has to be done at every point in time. So you see the demand curve shifting back and forth as it gets daytime. We don't use that much electricity. Then when it gets dark, we start turning on the light. You start using more electricity. Uh, but then in the middle of the night, when most people are asleep and most equipment is turned off, we actually use very little electricity, right? So you see the demand curve shift back and forth. Um, and that means that some plants are always on, always supplying electricity, whereas other sources of electricity are turned on and off and on and off and on and off, right? The implication of all this, and the implication that uh, the price is set where demand hits supply, if you look at the curve here, is if you're at the bottom of the curve, then you're at a big advantage. You're all, almost always on, and typically the price that you get is far, far higher than your vari variable cost of supply. So you make a, load of, a lot of money. Whereas if you're at the top end of the curve, you're not supplying as often, and if you are the marginal plant that sets the cost, sets the price, then you're delivering things at supply cost. That is, you're making no profit. So the implication of this is that the baseload plants wind and nuclear, coal, make a lot of money. The plants that are sort of in the middle of the merit order curve earn much less. 
and the ones that are at the very top earn very little. And yet, we don't want to be in a situation that in, on the 5th of December, you don't have enough electricity. So how do we reward those companies that take us through the peak? And that is the core uh, problem in England uh, and Wales. When the electricity market was uh, first liberalized, they created uh, this thing called the uh, Office for uh, Gas and Electricity Markets, and they appointed an economist at it, at, uh, as its head. And he was a very clever economist. He sort of worked out a theory, how could we supply uh, this electricity at peak? How could we reward peak supply of electricity? And the solution that Steve Littlechild uh, put forward was let's have long-term bilateral contracts between wholesalers, those who make electricity, and retailers, those who sell it to uh, you and me. And these long-term bilateral contracts would essentially create a stake in the suppliers and the generators to make sure that the public doesn't get unhappy because there's blackouts. That is the theory. And the theory is wonderful. And the theory works. Unfortunately, it does not work in reality because the theory was incomplete. Now, uh, Little Child was clever enough to say, we're going to try this, and if after five years it doesn't work, we're going to reevaluate the way we design this market. But this is now more than 20 years ago, and that reevaluation has been always been postponed, right? So we're sort of still stuck in a system that we know doesn't work. And the solution, the, the, the implication is very simple. If you come to the UK to build a power plant, you're going to build a baseload plant, because that is where the money is. You're not going to build a picker, because you can't earn anything from those. And as a result, we have a shortage of peak supply. Elsewhere, the system works differently. The system works the same as we do with reserve uh, power. That is, everybody pays a levy on the electricity that they sell, that is put into a big pot, then the regulator goes and organizes an auction and says, I want to buy peak capacity. Please sell it to me. That is a system that is theoretically inferior to the one that Little Child came up with 20 years ago, 25 years ago, but practically it actually works. England and Wales are moving uh, there, particularly under pressure uh, from the European Union, but uh, in the UK capacity markets unfortunately have been hijacked by uh, environmental policies. And having a lot of wind on the system is a problem, right? Because Previously, what I sketched was that supply and demand, or that uh, demand is shifting back and forth and back and forth during the day and uh, with the vagaries of the lighting and the weather and what have you. Uh, if you have a lot of wind on the system, wind is non-dispatchable. That is, you generate wind power when there is wind, not when you need wind power. Whereas gas power is dispatchable. That is, you turn on your gas turbine when you need electricity. Wind now also makes that the supply curve just keeps shifting uh, back and forward. And that makes uh, things uh, difficult. And then wind, of course, is always at the bottom of the merit order curve. Um, and that reduces the profitability of everybody else, right? So that reduces the incentive to invest, and particularly in peak uh, capacity. So that is one problem in environmental policy. There is an older environmental policy. Uh, if you ask your parents about acid rain, they will tell you horror stories, right? It's a problem that is largely solved in Europe, not in India, not in China, not in Africa, not in Latin America, but in Europe and North America it's largely solved. And we solved it, we're still solving it by closing down uh, coal-fired power plants, right? So that takes away uh, some of the supply. So because of all these reasons, essentially what power generators in the UK have been doing is just sweating their assets. There's just not enough investment. The regulator has not necessarily focused on these key problems. Uh, as I said, we now have a capacity auction, but the capacity auctions do not just serve the need of providing enough capacity, but they also use this to steer the total power supply into the desired political di direction, that is fewer greenhouse gases. <coughs> so uh, that has been hijacked a little bit and is therefore not working uh, as well as it should. 
And what we are doing at the moment in order to keep the lights on is essentially using diesel generators in case of emergency. Very dirty. Keeping the old coal plants open for longer than they should have, just to have more uh, capacity. Um, government does have uh, some initiative to increase supply, um, but that is mostly focusing on uh, new nuclear. Um, and at Miliband was uh, the Secretary for Energy, he announced uh, 10 new nuclear power plants. Uh, and just to put that in context, what you're looking at at the bottom is the power plants delivered by year over the entire history of civilian nuclear power. Uh, and 10 is actually a big number. Worldwide, that, I mean, at the peak, we built uh, 33 new nuclear power plants a year worldwide. Uh, and Miliband says, we got to do 10 in the UK, right? <laughs> But the UK, of course, is no longer a third of the world, right, if it was ever. And here we're looking at the plants that are currently under construction, and the, the focus there is on the numbers. Even China, which is the most gung-ho about new, uh, new nuclear, uh, is building only 28 at the moment, right? And Miliband once wanted to build 10. Now, this is not history. These pla plans were never changed. Also, Greg Clark wants to build 10 new nuclear power plants in the UK. No longer by 2020. The first one will not be delivered by 2020. Uh, but if you look at the government plans, this is still in there. When uh, Miliband first announced this, uh, some of us uh, almost fell off our chairs laughing because we knew these numbers, right? And it's actually almost impossible to build this. There's all sorts of issues with delays in building these things, there's waiting lists and so on and so forth. Nuclear power plants are sort of a mix of uh, low-skilled uh, concrete and very, very high-skilled technical stuff. And one of the, the key parts of uh, a power plant is the, the vessel, the reactor vessel, which is precision engineering in steel at a very large scale. So that thing has to be sort of like built in one go, uh, and it has to be exactly to the specifications, and if not, you have run into all sorts of problems. And as a result of the long slump in demand for new nuclear, there was only one company in the world that could make these reactor vessels. That's a company in Japan that, when Miliband announced this, had a waiting list of 15 years. So even if the UK would have got its uh, planning in order in time and putting uh, the order on the day of the announcement, then still Miliband would not have met the 2020 uh, target because nobody could build these things. <coughs> Another problem is, of course, that the UK is heavily promoting wind. Wind is variable, goes up and down and up and down all the time. The best way to run a nuclear power plant is steady. Just keep the supply so it's the ultimate base load. If you start ramping a nuclear power plant up and down, you run all sorts of risks with the equipment and everything, heating up, cooling down, heating up, cooling down. It's not good for a nuclear power plant. You really want to run it. You create all sorts of uh, risks uh, of accidents if you do so. So you really don't want to do that with nuclear. So nuclear and wind just don't mix, right? And at the moment, UK, uh, climate, uh, UK energy policy is all about mixing things, nuclear and wind, that just don't go together. So you've heard of Hinkley C, right, what happened there. So Mid Milliband announces 10 new nuclear power plants, starts a bidding process, gets voted out of office, is replaced uh, by the coalition government, uh, the previous one. They for a very long time insisted that these new nuclear power plants should all be there, but at the same should be delivered, uh, but at the same time should be delivered by the market. So you had this very peculiar ideological position that we have to have a certain type of outcome in the market, but at the same time we're not going to intervene in the market. That just doesn't work. Um, and as the negotiations, uh, negotiations went on and on and on and on, company after company that could possibly build this uh, walked away until there was one company left, uh, and that is Electricité, uh, Electricité de France. And at that point the government had a choice between losing face 
right? Because they had publicly announced they're going to build new nuclear or paying over the odds, right? And they decided on your behalf uh, that we would be paying over the odds, right? And the new nuclear that will come online in Hinkley C is probably the most expensive electricity that ever has been produced uh, at scale on the planet. Government doesn't care, right? The government has left office. Households will foot the bill. This is not history, right? We're still uh, doing this. Uh, Hinkley C, you've heard about. Size will see, you may have heard about. That's the second one uh, that, they're being, uh, that is being negotiated at the moment. And then there's eight more uh, to follow. All very peculiar. So let's wrap this up and move uh, to uh, the retail market. Uh, so an economist would sort of put all this under the heading of regulatory uncertainty. Uh, so the power market is and has to be heavily regulated. And, and that implies that whatever money you will make in the future, if you're considering an investment, the returns on that investment depends on future regulations. And if you have politicians who change their mind to come up with crazy plans and change their mind again, come up with other crazy plans, that creates uncertainty about your future profits. And that means that it's just not a very attractive investment. And that is exactly the problem. Uh, we have uh, a weak regulator uh, in the UK, I'll come back to that, and we have very excitable politicians, right? Uh, and here we're looking at uh, the faces uh, of some of them, some of these faces you will recognize. I have picked on Ed Miliband already, but there's uh, Lib Dem politicians, there's uh, Tory politicians who are uh, equally excitable. Uh, and some of these faces you recognize immediately as somebody who is not in there to have proper energy regulation, but who really sees the position as the energy minister as a way of getting up in the political world. And one uh, oil uh, exec has literally said that their company rather invests in Venezuela than in the UK, because at least in Venezuela you can count on politicians to stick to their word. So that is the reputation that these people have created. So will the lights go out this year? We'll see. Good thing is that some of the old uh, power plants have been mothballed rather than decommissioned. That is, we can revive them uh, at short notice, relatively short notice. We have invested uh, in uh, diesel plants. So hopefully uh, we'll make it through uh, another winter. You don't hear a lot about this in the news, unless there is sort of an, uh, an urgent risk uh, of a blackout. This is something that is always under the political radar. And the political attention has always been with the retail market. That's very understandable. On the supply side, you have two handfuls of companies to deal with. On the demand side, you have millions and millions of households to deal with who also happen to vote for you or for the competition, right? So if you want to make a political statement, you focus on the retail market. And there have been repeated accusations of market power, monopolistic behavior, price gouging by particularly the big six uh, electricity suppliers or energy suppliers. And it has been very hard uh, to miss this. This is the breakdown uh, of the electricity bill, the average electricity bill, dual fuel actually. Uh, most of it is just wholesale costs. Wholesale costs have gone up again in the UK because the pound is falling, right? And most of our fossil fuels are imported. There's cost of network, the second uh, biggest one. Um, then a lot of more conservative people like to talk about the costs imposed by environmental regulation, but that's just a small blue one, right? That is not what is driving up the cost of electricity and gas. And the cost of actually supplying this stuff to your home, uh, that's the third biggest cost. Uh, there's VAT, uh, obviously, in there. Uh, and then the small green wets, that is really the accounting profits of these companies. Those are not very big compared to all the rest. And of course, this is just the gross margin, right? This is before you subtract the costs of actually building all the equipment and rewarding your capital investment. So it's not uh, excessive. There is no sign in this market of price gouging, no matter what the newspapers tell you, no matter what nowadays also parts of government tell you, there is simply no evidence uh, for this. Returns on investment in this market 
are fairly low, 4 to 5 percent, which is not uh, excessive. Um, and this is exactly what you would expect. If you read the textbooks on industrial organization, particularly the work of Jean Tirole, what you find is that for a market to work properly, I mean, yes, in micro we sort of tell you, yeah, a perfect market has an infinite number of suppliers. But really, what industrial organization teaches us is that if you have more than four suppliers in the market, then the market is close to perfect. That really the way we should count the, the, the monopolistic power in the market is one, two, three, four, infinity. And we have six big suppliers in the retail market and about 35 small suppliers. There's 40 odd companies active in this market. There is no reason whatsoever to assume that this market is not competitive. And two of the big six are actually turning a loss. Which again, at least in the retail market, which again suggests that there's no issues with monopolistic behavior. Some people claim that the big six overcharge their customers because they're charging higher prices than the competition. But the reason that they're charging higher prices than the small, smaller uh, challenging, uh, challenger companies uh, is twofold. One, the big six have legacy costs. They typically have an older workforce with more illness, higher pensions, and so on and so forth. Uh, which just drives up their costs, whereas the challenger companies typically are small and have only just started, have a young workforce, haven't built up their pension liabilities, and so on and so forth. So that is one reason why uh, there is a cost difference. Uh, and the second reason is that the new companies, the uh, challenger companies, typically have contracts that apply to the low end of the merit order curve. And that's where they get all their electricity from, and they're so small that they actually can just pick part of the supply curve, whereas if you have to supply lots of electricity all the time, then you actually need to spread yourself over the entire merit curve. The retail market by no, is by no means perfect, right? Uh, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that there's no evidence of price gouging. And the big issue in the retail market at the moment, and this is not just the electricity, this is also for insurance and all those sort of things, um, is that customers do not like to switch. They are loyal. It's very simple. Your electricity company will send you a letter every year saying, if you don't do anything, we will renew your contract for another year. And people like me at that point think, yeah, I don't have to do anything. And that's perfectly fine, right? If I pay uh, 50 pounds more for my electricity than I should have, that is not a big deal for somebody on my income. So the fact that my household doesn't switch is to a cheaper supplier is just a sign of us not bothering with switching and it's not something that the government should intervene. Um, there's also a segment in the market, particularly elderly, less well-educated uh, customers who do not dare to switch because they are afraid of computers, they're afraid of bureaucracy. Uh, and there we have a real potential for abuse of power, and um, which of course should be solved by helping those people to switch, and there's been fairly active programs for that. Last year, 20%, 21% of electricity consumers switched supplier, which again suggests that competition is fairly healthy. Uh, but as I said, this is where the voters are, politicians are excitable, uh, so I'm going to take you through uh, four things that were proposed in the past and one thing that is currently on the table just to show some of the uh, market responses, right? So at one point, a Davy forbade uh, price discrimination. Essentially what companies have been doing is they've been offering discounts to new customers, which of course is unfair to the existing customers because they pay more and Davy said, ha, I'm going to stop that. The immediate response is, of course, the logical response is that there's no more price discrimination and therefore the incentive to switch is less. And you reduce competition rather than increase competition. Thank you, Ed. And David Cameron, uh, not that David, David Cameron uh, at one point ordained that there can be only four tariffs per supplier. And a day later, 
companies started taking away the <coughs> cheapest tariffs, right? If there can be only four, then of course I'm going to pick the ones that are the four that are most profitable, rather than the four that David Cameron might want to see. So this reduces, uh, this increases transparency, right? Now you have to choose not from 40 suppliers and maybe uh, 800 uh, tariffs. Now it goes down to four suppliers uh, and 160 tariffs that you can choose from, right? 160 is still a long list of potential tariffs. But uh, of course what happens there is that the niche products were taken off. Uh, there was simply uh, less consumer choice. So again, less competition. Same government sort of said, let's put everyone on the lowest tariff that is currently on offer. So a day later, those lowest tariffs were no longer on offer. In their election manifesto, Labour promised to freeze retail prices, and as a result, prices immediately went up, right? Because if the price is frozen, then it better be frozen at a higher level if you're uh, in on the supply side. The current government, and this comes directly from Theresa May, has proposed price regulation. Essentially, what the current government plans to do, I don't think we should take this too seriously, I don't think the government will make it to Christmas, I think government will fall before they get this into place, uh, but the plan is to put a price cap on electricity. If the price of electricity is capped, you again discourage switching, because there is less gain from switching, so you reduce competition. Within firms, if prices are capped, means that the highest tariffs are coming down, you're still under pressure from your shareholders to produce a decent return on investment. So the only way you can cope with a reduction in your highest tariff, tariffs is to increase your lowest tariffs. Now you may say, well, then those companies that are forced to do this will go out of the market, right? With uh, or lose market share. That may well be if they really go bankrupt. Then that means that you're socializing the legacy costs that make them expensive in the first place. That is, the, the company goes bankrupt, can no longer pay for their pensions, and that means that somebody else, namely the taxpayer, will have to cough up those pensions, right? But if the expensive suppliers, the, the, oh, sorry, the other reason why some suppliers are more expensive than others is because they're higher up the merit order curve. But if those companies disappear or lose market share, then the cheap companies are forced up the merit order curve, right? Because they have to meet the supply. So their average cost will necessarily rise. Price caps are not the solution here. Um, so how did we get here, right? What happened? So who do we see on the left-hand side? Come on, who is on the left-hand side? You're not telling me that you don't recognize Mark Carney. And this works if you guys say on the left hand side we see Mark Carney, but on the right hand side we don't know who that guy is. Uh, these two people, uh, Mark Carney on the left hand side and Dermot Nolan on the right hand side, have the same statutory powers in the UK. Right? One is uh, in charge of the independent monetary and financial regulator, the Bank of England. The other is in charge of the independent energy regulator. Mark Carney has the standing and the balls to tell politicians to go away. Dermot Nolan does not. He has the statutory powers, he just doesn't have the personality. He's a very clever guy, very nice guy. He just doesn't have this uh, power. So really, the key problem here is that politicians have been playing politics with our energy supply, and the energy regulator does not have the way of it all or the will or the courage to tell them to go away. And really we should move to a situation where Parliament sort of sets the broad outlines of the energy policy that we will, that we want to have. And energy policy always has to solve three problems, right? Uh, the so-called energy trilemma. That is, we want a reliable supply of electricity, we want an affordable supply of electricity, and we want our electricity to be clean. Those are the free ideals. And unfortunately, if you make it more clean, it becomes more expensive, and you can make it cheaper by making it less reliable, so you have to make those trade-offs. And making those trade-offs is a politician's job. This is our reliability standard, this is our cleanliness standard, this is our affordability standard. But then the details 
on how to actually meet those, just as with the Independent Bank of England, has to be sorted out by sober technocrats, <coughs> not by excitable politicians who stick their head on television and say we've got to change uh, energy policy overnight just because uh, I think so, just because that will score me a few vo votes, uh, even though I haven't talked to any, uh, any expert about this, we really need to take the politics out of energy do we, if we want to avoid these sort of situations in the future. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention.